Kia ora welcome uh, to this meeting of the Dunedin City Council for the 31st of January. Welcome uh, colleagues, staff, uh, members of the public and the media. We have no public forum uh, today. Apologies, um, we've got an apology from Councillor Gary, an apology uh, for potentially early departure from Councillor Vandervis, depending on how efficient the meeting is dealt with, efficiently the meeting is dealt with. I'll move that the apologies be accepted. Seconded Councillor Benson Pope. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? Uh, that's agreed. Confirmation of the agenda. Uh, I'll move that the agenda be confirmed with the following alteration uh, that in regard to Standing Order 21.4, Option C be adopted in relation to moving and seconding and speaking to amendments. Seconded Councillor Staines. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Uh, declarations of interest. Any amendments to the declarations? Register, in which case I'll move that the Council and note the elected members' interest register confirms the proposed management plan for it and notes the uh, executive leadership team register attached as attachment B. Seconded, Councillor Alder. Thank you. Uh, all those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. Part A reports. Re uh, number five, review of the camping control bylaw. Mr Hogg and Mr West, welcome. Morning, sir. Any opening comments from you? Thank you. If you could use your microphone, that would be helpful. Questions, councillors? Okay. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, Mr. West, just um, looking at the executive summary, paragraph four, can you give me? Um, some indication when it says the current bylaw lacks flexibility and uh, does not allow council to quickly respond to the challenge, changing freedom camping volumes and issues, and a more flexible bylaw would ensure the council can continue to proactively manage and respond to rapidly changing freedom camping volumes and issues. Some examples of that? Yeah, I, think, I think what we're referring to there, councillor, is um, what we're seeing is a fairly rapidly changing picture um, and I think what we're trying to so we've 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 achieved some success I think probably in the last season uh, we continue to see changes particularly in volume and the length of the season and where people are choosing to freedom camp um, so I think uh, we can't sit on our laurels and we have to look at ways that we can be as flexible and responsive as possible now, obviously, within the bylaw and the Freedom Camping Act, there's only a certain amount of flexibility that's allowed. So what we're referring to is looking at, uh, particularly at the trial at Thomas Burns, which has been successful. Uh, and I think it's about um, having the ability to um, uh, be f f uh, the ability to, to move quickly and uh, on a season by season basis. Does that, does that answer your question? No, that's good, that's good, thank you. The other um, question I have is, is the government doing anything in their work stream around uh, reviewing freedom camping that would uh, have any effect on the timing of this uh, review of the bylaw? So I think the government have been doing quite a lot of work in the last two years, and uh, certainly the emphasis has been on the ambassador education role, which I think has seen some pretty good positive effects. Um, uh, and that the, um, the MB, I think it's an MB work, uh, working party, continues to look at uh, opportunities to make improvements as well. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Is that on? Okay. Um, thank you for an excellent report. Uh, I have a number of questions. Uh, first one is on page 29, where you have the graphs just on the breakdown of the topic of complaints. Um, as the largest proportion there is actual ge actually general complaints, can you just expand a wee bit on what constitutes general complaints? Uh, yeah, so general, in, uh, general complaints would be those that don't specifically relate to a uh, bylaw infringement. So those might include um, 
complaints uh, around um, freedom camping management strategy or um, um, yeah, basically anything that we wouldn't consider to be someone informing us that the bylaw's been breached. Further to that answer, um, if somebody was, um, for example, say homeless people sleeping in cars for an extended period, how would they be categorised and what, would, what actions would be taken against said people? Um, so uh, that is something, that, that is an issue that we're aware of and um, it's something that we, um, what we, that we react to in a, in a different way. Um, we are uh, generally able to identify those people and provide them with Ministry of uh, Social Development information. Um, and uh, I, I'd say it's, it's handled in a different way than... Um, I can add to that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, I, that, that has um, been an issue with, that has been raised with me probably twice this season already. Um, as Stephen's indicated, we don't, we don't go out and treat that as an infringement issue. That isn't the way we deal with it. And it's usually fairly clear if there's a homelessness issue. Um, and we work with other departments in council and other agencies such as the police to try and resolve that. So we don't go in heavy handed with an infringement. Um, um, we try and resolve it in a different way. That's really encouraging to hear. And uh, another question around um, the self-contained status of vehicles. I know there's been a particular problem throughout the country with non-self-contained vehicles having self-contained stickers. Do you come across that? And if you do, how do you address it or rectify it? Um, so the, um, the self-containment certificates are more than just the little blue sticker you see on the back of the car, which is um, obviously not particularly hard to replicate. Um, the self-containment certificates are uh, issued by an issuing authority um, who has determined that they meet the requirements of the NZS standard. Um, our enforcement team are quite aware of the fact that there are some fraudulent uh, stickers and certificates out there. They're quite good at identifying those that appear to be perhaps um, not legitimate, um, but it's not actually a, um, a common occurrence for us to find those. So what I'd suggest is most of the, the certificates that exist on the vehicles, the actual certificates, those um, have been issued correctly by the issuing authority. Uh, just one uh, final question. In next steps, uh, point 15, uh, just what's the timeline on that? So uh, we're aware, Councillor, that uh, even though we're, um, only, we're at the peak of this current season, next season uh, will be kicking off before we know it. So the, the aim is to get a draft uh, bylaw to council uh, probably in March or April so that you can be looking at it because we need to get ready for next season. Councillor Vannevis. Check. Um, on page 23, we have uh, a line near the top that says that 161 of the infringement notices were waived after they were contested by recipients. Um, it seems rather a lot to be waived, and I'm wondering why it was that they were issued in the first place, generally. Um, so the majority of those infringement notices that were waived were waived when it was determined that the vehicle um, had a valid self-containment certificate but was issued with an infringement notice because uh, at the time of the infringement, uh, at, the time, at the time the enforcement team visited, they, um, they determined the vehicle didn't have that um, self-containment certificate. So um, what we're seeing is that some of the issuing authorities will check a vehicle to make sure it's um, NZS compliant, but there's a delay period before the, um, the self-containment certificate is issued. And so what we tend to see is that um, a lot of campers and travellers will continue travelling and um, the certificate's sent to them in the mail and it doesn't tend to arrive um, when we conduct our controls, so. Okay, so it's basically a timing issue uh, for most of those notices, and uh, it has to do with the fact that the, you've got a transitory uh, group of people. There is one other issue that probably would be useful to draw your attention to, as well as the trans transcribing uh, issues that we have when the security go out and record the infringements. So one of the things we're looking at doing for hopefully this, 
this season, but maybe into next season, is looking at um, using handheld technology so the security can actually enter the infringement more accurately and take photographs, and, and it will then go straight through to our customer services agency and reduce the, uh, the error rate. So there's a, there's a component there of error rate at the moment. When you record the uh, vehicle registration number, is, there, uh, is it not possible at that point already to know whether it has been uh, certified as self-contained? Um, the, there are a number of issuing authorities who issue those certificates. They do have um, databases. It would be quite a, a time, uh, quite a time-consuming process to do that on-site. Um, also, you might be in an area where there's limited um, cell phone reception, for example, so it's just right. not practical on the ground. Okay, and, and finally, given that there were uh, approximately 30,000 people freedom camping in the city last year, um, do you consider that this rate of infringements notices is, is reasonable? I mean, that's an awful lot of freedom campers, most of whom don't seem to have caused any problems. I think what we're seeing, councillor, not just it within the city, but a, across certainly uh, what I'm reading across the lower South Island is a huge drop in infringement, infringement notices this year. So we're part of a wider trend. Um, and uh, uh, certainly I was asking questions early in the season as to whether that was because we weren't catching out people in the same way. But we've got increased security. Uh, and uh, I think the general feedback is people are listening and complying. And certainly when we look at um, some of the apps, CamperMate and some of those others, I think there's a much higher awareness of people coming uh, into the country um, and being aware of what, what the requirements are. So we're seeing increased compliance. It's great to hear. And um, just finally, in comparison to Queenstown, which had some really serious problems, um, are they doing as well as us in terms of having very large numbers but relatively no low compliance issues? I, I don't know as we know whether how they're doing um, from compliance issues. Obviously they're taking quite a different approach to the Eden City Council um, and obviously they have a significant larger volume um, so, but I can't actually comment on their compliance rates. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you for your report. We've certainly noticed out at Pukekura that we're not having the freedom camping issues that we did have out there, which is fantastic. I just have a couple of questions. I see that on, um, on point number nine that the freedom camping volumes have grown 27% in Dunedin. How does that compare with the national average, do you know? Sorry, we, we, we can't answer that. Happy to... Um, um, look at that when we send out our monthly reports maybe from now on just so you yeah. council uh, get a wider understanding of how we're tracking against the rest of the uh, country so we'll see if we can incorporate that kind of information for you thank you it would be useful to know if we were becoming more of a freedom camping destination what our visitor mix was looking like and the other question i have is have you had any feedback from the commercial camping grounds about the effect of the council running free camping in the middle of the city for um, freedom campers? Um, no, it's, it has been quiet. Um, I think council probably had certainly one public forum speaker um, raising concerns that I'm aware of, but generally not, no. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that they're not unhappy with it, of course. It just means to say that they haven't, uh, we're not aware of it at the stage. Councillor Reddick. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you for your report. Uh, uh, step for item number 15 is um, we'll address the end of identified issues. Uh, so I don't see a list of identified issues, but are those issues yet to be identified and collated? No, I think the issues that we're uh, alluding to there are um, the change in volume, uh, particularly, uh, and the change in the patterns of... Um, campers and volumes across the city. So we're, we're kind of aware, aware of that, councillor. Um, and I think what we're looking at is um, um, 
particularly when, when that draft bylaw comes back to you, one of the things I can tell you will be in there will be um, a recommendation uh, for consultation on making uh, the Thomas Burns site a permanent site, um, not, not year round. Uh, because we need to, I think that's where the flex comes in. I think that's where we need to be nimble. So we don't need a Thomas Burns for 12 months a year, <coughs> but what we do is we do need a city centre site. I think it's proven that we would need that for, for the season, for the peak of the season. Does that, does that answer your question? Um, well, yes. Uh, I would have liked to have seen a, a list of the identified issues specifically, but that's fine. Um, uh, just further to, to that, one of the issues, of course, is the call of nature, and it's very hard to legislate against the call of nature, but we can, um, yeah, we can pro provide more toilet facilities. So I th would like to think that your review of the bylaw will dovetail into their, their toilet report resolution that we uh, voted on yesterday. Yeah, we will certainly um, consider that. Councillor Elder. Thanks for your report and I note that the Thomas Burns site has been um, very successful and was the result of being flexible and, uh, and um, changing things to make things work. Um, I've just got a couple of questions um, around you're working closer with DOC, is that right? What's the story there? Uh, so we've, we've been working with obviously the range of positions that we brought in last season um, we've increased them this season. Um, we're probably unique in that uh, we, as a city, have decided to work in collaboration with DOC. Um, so not only do those rangers look after our freedom campaign, they're also assisting us with reserves and beaches bylaw um, and also have the ability then to visit DOC sites and uh, do education for DOC sites. So um, it's, uh, I think that's the most efficient way of doing it and uh, I think it also adds um, um, it adds an, an extra component uh, to, to, that, to that role that we probably wouldn't see if we were just doing it on our own. So do, do DOC fund some positions then too? So are they sharing the cost w with us for that? Uh, yeah, so DOC, DOC traditionally have had some arrangers in the city um, and so they've always funded that and we've basically added the, the money we've had in the MB funding for the last two years to increase the um, capacity. Okay, um, so is, ha, ha, has there been an attempt at all at finding out the economic benefit of having 30,000 extra happy guests in Dunedin? Um, so we, uh, we ran a survey last season um, which uh, did have a focus on the economic benefit and the, uh, the money was, that was being spent by Freedom Campers. Um, what, we'll, what we're attempting to do this year is improve on that, that survey. Um, what we'd like to do is ensure that we're, um, we've got an adequate um, sample size to, to ensure that it's accurate and um, also attempt to make sure that those, we get a spread of uh, survey participants across the city at different sites so we can compare um, where campers in different places, uh, what they're spending, where there's trends there. Um, so yes, we'll, we'll hopefully, um, this year we'll see it on a larger scale and um, with a bit more detail. Congratulations also on getting MB support for paying for ranges, et cetera, because it's proved really, um, really beneficial. Um, and are we expecting the government to continue with that kind of support in the future? Um, I don't, I don't, don't know the answer to that. Um, and as as we discussed the annual plan with the parks budget, we have built um, budget into our budget for 2021, um, and um, because we don't want to be reliant on that um, money if it's no longer available, um, and it also allows us to continue if the money is available to look at opportunities to make further improvements to manage it because if we continue to see volume increase we have to keep thinking how we're going to resolve it and it isn't it isn't a one silver bullet option we, we have to look at lots of different initiatives I think thank you and thank you for all your hard work Councillor Lofisal uh, thank you your worship 
Thank you, gentlemen, for your work and guidance um, to us on this matter. Um, I'm referring to page uh, 24, the summary of considerations, just in, in respect of Mana Whenua's request to have uh, Wellers Rock and Te Roa, Te Roa One Beach as res uh, restricted zones. Um, are there, are there, what's the process if um, Mana Whenua at Pukitaraki, Karitani, um, have concerns or anything about unrestricted? We haven't had any discussions with them at this stage, but I think, again, as we learn and evolve in this process, we're going to get better at, at those processes as we move forward, and uh, it's always useful to be reminded that we need to be doing those things. So I think, um, from my perspective, this is, uh, as I've just said to Councillor Elder, there's no, we're never going to get to the end of the solution of this. It's always going to be a work in progress. Councillor O'Malley. Your Worship, um, my question gets back to the consultation process. Um, obviously, the two community boards that have the existing um, freedom camping sites have fairly good insight into what the impact is and also some of the solutions. And in fact, the urban park was, was brought up by the Waikato Coast Community Board three years ago. Um, so bef I'm asking, would you potentially um, engage with them as affected parties <coughs> during the period to which when you're writing the draft rather than after the draft is written because because in this draft unlike other bylaws there's actually um, operating activities in the bylaw we're identifying sites and, and if we and and what we found in the last bylaw was when the urban site was first mooted we were told well it's not on the list of approved sites in the bylaw so if we get to the point where we come out to consultation and those affected parties then only get to put their input in, we've already written some of the document already. So I guess I'm asking, would you be willing to talk to the two community boards that already have um, sites in them as you go through the drafting process? Yeah, it, it makes sense to me that we have those conversations uh, with people that are, have a, a, a large interest in this subject. Um, because the more we talk to people, the better the result we're going to get. Um, I, I am mindful, though, Councillor, that um, under the Freedom Camping Act, um, we, we, I think we've got a pretty good bylaw here right now, and so uh, we've got to balance uh, targeted uh, specific um, changes to it, which I think we might see coming in the years for coming forward if we continue to see volume changes that we're experiencing now. Uh, versus uh, what would be deemed a, uh, a general review of the bylaw, which would be putting it all out for consultation. And so we might need to seek advice on how f wide we can go with our consultation without it being a complete um, um, review of the bylaw. There's no legal limit to say you can't talk to somebody, so... No, no, no. I know we'd, uh, well, I, so I'll go back to my starting opening statement there, which is the more people we, we involve in those conversations that have uh, an interest and specific knowledge, uh, the better, I think. I just have a question um, around paragraph 9, and it's about how the data is presented, um, because we're... This just catalogues you know, total numbers, upheld infringements, complaints received, um, and the percentage change is mapping upwards, um, but we don't express it as a percentage of the total volume. So while upheld infringements are up 20% and complaints received are up 31%, <laughs> as, as a proportion of the total volume, it's significantly decreasing over that period of time. Both in terms of in both complaints and upheld infringements, and I just think that maybe that might be a helpful column to add, if you like, to to see so that people can see how this is tracking. Yeah, I mean, um, we this is uh, Stephen has done a huge amount of work in the last 12 months on getting data so that you're all able, and we want more visibility with the data, and we share this with community boards um, um, and uh, the community now. Um, so any feedback on how we can improve it, we're, we're more than willing to uh, receive that. Um, we'll, we'll adjust it as we go forward and try and refine it and get better so that it's more useful for us. Thank you. It's helpful. Councillor Lord. Yeah. They're going to go or not? Yep. Um, yeah, look, I wasn't going to ask the question, but I, I was noting a similar question to what the Mayor's just referred to, and I, 
I guess I can remember being here six or seven years ago when there was a number of people coming and submitting. There was community board unrest. There was, there seemed to be, there seems to me, in spite of the fact that uh, those figures are up a bit, when you look at the, as, as Councillor Barker referred, 27% increase uh, in the last year alone, there seems to be significantly less talk, negativity, um, I just see less on Facebook and that sort of thing generally. So my my question would be has that um, has the actual number of um, things although it's increased as a percentage it seems to me that people are generally happier in the city not the freedom campers themselves but the city residents don't seem to be don't reflect the increase in complaints even does that make sense sorry um, yes I'd, I'd say I'd say that that's the case, um, and uh, I think as well we we're um, we're quite encouraging for people to come forward and, and report um, bylaw infringements. So I think what we're seeing now is um, whereas we did see a lot of general complaints in the past, I think now we're starting to see just um, most of our most of our complaints actually just being people reporting that there's a vehicle that we should be aware of and can we send our team, and so we react to those very quickly. Yeah, the other question I may as well ask now, but I live rurally, so I'm down along the Henley River around that area, Berwick, and occasionally you see people come in late at night, stop, camp and leave, but it would it almost seem to me now that for whatever reason, whether it's Thomas Burns' site or whatever, but all the different apps that are around, but we seem to be getting almost less of those, and I wonder if that's been evidenced anywhere, less people just stopping in lay buys and that sort of thing, or got an opinion about that? Uh, I, I'm... Um, I Certainly, that anecdotally, that's what I hear as well. That's what people are telling me around, particularly around the town belt. I heard had someone commenting to me yesterday that they're not seeing so much freedom camping going on in the town belt. Um, statistically, I don't know whether we can um, say that because we've never really collected the data um, for those rural areas, so it's kind of hard to, to say that. Councillor Reddick. Following on those comments, uh, based on the your projections for 2019-20, you're looking you're projecting only a third of the um, upheld infringements compared to last year and previous years. So, as a proportion of the amount of people coming, you're going to you're you're projecting much decreased volumes of in, infringements and similarly of, of complaints. And is that how it's tracking currently? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Essentially, so um, the those projections were based on the number of upheld infringements and number of complaints received so far from November 2019 and December 2019. So we've seen quite a sharp decrease in complaints and infringements, um, and so uh, that's how those projections were made. And um, we believe that um, the initiatives that we've been that we've worked to to implement. Um, are having an effect that's positive, and so um, we would expect that those that those trends to continue throughout the season. So, would you say that that was a, as a result of this bylaw back in 15 and your enforcement or you know policing uh, thereof? Uh, it's really hard to pinpoint exactly which of the initiatives have made the biggest impact, but I suspect this, the Thomas Burns trial is, is significant there. I think the Ranger initiative has been significant. Um, I actually think the increased security has been significant as well, because people will be aware, and certainly those um, Freedom Campers on apps are sharing information. So I believe that people know that if they come to Dunedin and they are freedom camping in, in, a, in the incorrect place, they're likely to get a $200 infringement. So I think it's a combination of things. So my final question, is it okay if I say well done? <laughs> I'll allow it. Thank you. Further questions? Someone like to move Councillor O'Malley, second to Councillor Hall. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Thank you, Bishop. Um, I'm just going to also address some of the things that came up in question time because they're comments, not questions. Um, one of the things that was raised early on in the Freedom Camping story was, was um, 
people not having access to toilet facilities and, and therefore lots of stuff going on outside those facilities. And the response, especially in Warrington, was, to, was in fact to create more facilities there. And as soon as we created them, the problem went away. Um, likewise, the camping grounds um, owners did at first offer a lot of concern about the effects of our accommodating freedom campers, but have now acknowledged that during the summer season their camping grounds are at capacity anyway. So therefore, we're having almost no impact on their earnings during the summer season. And there is one camping ground that still says that it's not happy about what we're doing during the winter phase. But as far as I know, that's largely gone away. And in fact, that inability of the camping grounds to take the volume was one of the things that was raised in the debate at the time when we decided what we were going to do about whether we would continue with accommodating freedom camping or outlaw it. Um, and that brings me to the Dunedin City approach in general. We are quite different from Queenstown Lake District Council. We have a, an approach of accommodation and to address the issue by actually providing designated sites that meet the demand. Accompanied with a policing environment that says that if you don't use the designated sites, then we'll give you a ticket. Queenstown has tended to go in the direction of use the commercial sites or we'll ticket you, and then that has not worked for them at all. And then they vacillate backwards and forwards between accommodation and, and fining and have still yet to get to a resolution that works for them. I believe that the reason the problem has gone away in Dunedin largely, or at least reduced itself down, is because of the approach we are taking. Um, so I encourage you as you go forward to take the observation that we made from the Waikato Community Board um, looking at the Warrington domain and, and the large number of interviews that that community board has done with Freedom Campers, that there is a demand and a desire to use the urban sites. And I think we saw that when the Thomas Burns site opened up. So I would actually encourage you to think about not only continuing with Thomas Burns, but thinking about whether or not, in fact, you could make it larger. Um, the other thing that I would ask you to be considering as you're going forward is that um, the Warrington domain, um, the people in Warrington have asked whether or not in fact some of those sites could be reduced so the domain itself could be left more free. Um, and I think these will be the things I'm hoping that you will couch as you go forward in the bylaw review. Um, I want to commend your team though. Um, we have come a long way in three years and the consequence of doing that has been, in my opinion, that the public are happy with the city's response. It hasn't been the end of the camping grounds, and in fact what it has been is the end of this, as you just said, it, random parking all through the city. People have an opportunity to go to a place. We have the right to enforce if they don't go there, and those combinations of two activities I think is giving us good outcomes. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Walker. Yeah, I just want to probably echo some of what Councillor, um, I've forgotten your name, O'Malley. I'll get there within three years, uh, <laughs> Councillor O'Malley. And, pr and probably addressing uh, uh, some of what uh, the Councillor's name, I can't remember Councillor Lord's uh, point. Um, to answer that, and it's probably, Councillor Lord, the fact that in, coming from the Community Board um, background prior to this position, that Councillor has been extremely proactive in um, addressing this problem over the last three to six years throughout the city, and I think they should be commended for that. And I'm also very proud now to be part of a council that is not getting into that awful and dangerous territory of, of vilifying Freedom Campus, who on the whole um, respect and leave this city in a good state when they um, take advantage of it and leave it. And I think we should all be, be, be very proud of being part of, uh, of taking that stance. And I think we should just uh, continue to, to welcome campers who, as I say, on the whole, um, act extremely responsibly. So, well done, guys. Councillor Wiley. Uh, thank you, Worship. I think this, is, um, this report is a pretty good summary of what is uh, taking place, and uh, the review is, I think, a, a good time to do it. I think the key uh, piece of information that I see from this report is in the next steps. It allows the community to know that actually their feedback, positive or negative, is going to be heard later this year, and that, that they should actually take the time to look around what's happening in the city now and be prepared for the uh, submissions and look at the consultation when it comes out, possibly in April or so, uh, so they can be heard and their voices will be uh, encouraged. And one of the problems of consultation is sometimes we don't hear all the parties and all the views come to the table, so I would like to actually have the community at large to ma start making their notes now, seeing what's actually factually happening around the city, again, positively or negatively, so we can listen to those um, through the winter. Thank you.
Councillor Elder. Oh, I didn't hear you. Oh, my apologies. It's okay. Further speakers? Um, I just want to add my thanks to staff for this work. It's incredibly difficult. Uh, and has been incredibly difficult over the, not just uh, the past couple of seasons, but the past few years, not just in terms of managing public expectations around this, but dealing with uh, a transient population of visitors, which makes uh, the regulatory arm um, uh, of, of this issue um, difficult. And obviously, as has been mentioned, correlation isn't causation, but I think uh, what the figures show is that a helpful and hospitable approach to dealing with this issue uh, has been effective, both in terms of uh, in, in terms of both of those communities, actually, both the, the resident population and visitors coming through here, and that despite um, significantly increased numbers, uh, the amount of, of disquiet that has accompanied them has um, dropped off uh, equally significantly, and so uh, I applaud both the staff uh, and the contractors, actually, who have been involved in, in helping us uh, do this work and look forward to a more fulsome review uh, as this comes back multiple times over the next 12 months or so. Uh, Councillor O'Malley, your right of reply. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Thank you. Item six, submission on resource management issues and options paper. Dr Johnson, Ms Pinfold, I lost the raffle. I'll just have that facing Councillor Walker so he can remember. <laughs> Any opening comments from the two of you? Just to say that this is the, um, this, the, the submission was circulated to you in draft for comment uh, a few day, uh, week or so ago. Uh, the comments that were received, which were relatively limited, have been incorporated, so the submission's essentially as circulated to you previously. Thank you. Questions, councillors? Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, the, probably the first part of as going reading this uh, paper is this is very much focused on the environment impacts of the RMA, correct? Um, well, it's a comprehensive look at New Zealand's resource management legislation and um, it really opens the door to re-examining um, its effectiveness and uh, so it, it's quite a broad bit of consultation which is I suppose unusual um, for the ministry so it is a, a really excellent opportunity for Dunedin to reflect on how well the RMA is working here and what we'd like to see come out of it. Okay, so on paragraph 7 um, on page 55, it says the aim of the government's review was to improve environment outcomes and enable better and timely urban developments within environmental limits. Um, that's where I'm sort of heading, yeah. Oh, okay, so um, I didn't write that paragraph, so <laughs> I'm not sure where that particular paragraph came from, but um, my reading of the issues and options document is it's a review of the system of resource management in New Zealand. So it's a comprehensive look at the Resource Management Act and also looking at how that legislation interacts with other legislation like the Local Government Act and um, land transportation planning. So it, it's probably quite broader than that um, sentence portrays and I'm not sure where that quote came from. <coughs> Thank you. One of the things that I, as I was reading through this, and um, was uh, again on page 60, um, paragraph 6, was adhere to the principles of smart growth. And I'd just like to get a clarification of the definition of smart growth. Okay, well, there's, there's been a lot written on smart growth, but essentially it looks at how um, cities can grow and some of the, the benefits and costs of different patterns of growth. So um, you may be familiar with the term urban sprawl. So urban sprawl has sort of been one of the critiques about how a lot of modern cities that have developed rapidly in the sort of post-car era have developed where they're very, um, they've created very car dependent forms of development. So suburbs that don't have local shops where people, you know, can't 
uh, travel to any key destinations like shopping or schools or recreational activities unless they drive. So smart growth really tries to look at that form of development against sort of some of the more traditional forms of development that occurred prior to the car being king, I suppose, and that where people have options in how they get around the city, that they're designed so people have local access to shops, that there's local schools, that people can um, better travel and access the things that they need within a city, and also, um, so that's sort of, I guess, the social benefits of it, but there's also broader environmental benefits and considerations around how you might protect waterways in a city or other sort of things that you need to do to design a city well. So it's, it's a whole range of things that examine smart urban planning and how to um, allow a city to grow with the best environmental and social cultural benefits. Okay. So in um, this document, one of the things it made reference to was the National Policy Statement on Urban Development Capacity. But yet I don't see a lot of that being included here. Is, do you feel like there's enough of that that has been included in the submission or because it was more an environmental process approach to the RMA? Um, I think the, the government's agenda is really very squarely focused on housing capacity issues. So I think we um, have supported that agenda in this submission and in other submissions, but we probably haven't said a lot about it, but mainly because it's well covered already. I think the submission that we've made is not um, contradicting some of the things that they've acknowledged they need to address, but more adding to it and focusing on things that are perhaps missing from their assessment. Yep. So. Okay. Um, paragraph 12, back on page 55, there was a uh, comment the DC submission is wide-ranging, but its core stresses the need for the urban planning function to remain local. Do you see, you know, obviously in, there's a lot of reference to smaller communities, but, and I think it was a 30,000 plus was when they looked at having a more local approach to RMA uh, and having central offices or RMA offices as such. Is there... Um, do you see that being a, a worry to see that urban planning may go more centralised? Um, well, I do. I think to the extent that um, communities uh, generally want to have control of their own futures. And, and Dunedin certainly, I think, is a community that values local democracy and local participation a lot. And so reflecting the views of people in Dunedin, I don't think they would prefer that decision-making about the future of their city was handed over to Wellington, nor do I think that would um, improve any outcomes. I think there are things that can be done to improve outcomes that do not need to remove local decision-making. Okay. And then, uh, sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit, uh, page 61, paragraph 13, um, just, uh, actually, no, I've already covered that one. The comment I made was about the um, regional councils, um, is the question I'm looking for, the regional councils' in effect or uh, involvement in um, local planning. Yes, Concept so um, I think one of the ideas the document uh, toys around with is the benefits of centralization, either at the regional level or at the central government level, um, in achieving things more quickly. So it's a question of, um, and, and also more cost effectively. So it, you know, it is a balance, this idea of local decision making with capacity and the costs of having staff and doing all these things your, yourself. So the submission talks about um, differentiating an approach between larger cities uh, and fast-growing cities from very small settlements because um, it is fair to say that it is really difficult for some very small councils to have adequate staff and resourcing to do all their own town planning and that um, in those cases it may be beneficial to take a regional approach just purely because of the cost of, of um, doing that work. So it is really balancing the two ideas of local decision making with uh, cost effectiveness and the efficiency of the system. And the submission tries to, I guess, draw the line between when 
it should tip one way or the other. Thank you. Councillor Reddick. Uh, yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, you used the term before answering Councillor Wiley, uh, the post-car era. Could you explain what you mean by that, please? Oh, the post-car era. So I guess um, in if you study to become a planner, um, they talk a lot about um, when cities were built sort of in the post-war era, which would be you know, roughly after World War II. Now, if you look at suburbs, there's a clear distinction between suburbs that were built in the 30s and 40s and 50s and those that were built in the 60s, 70s and 80s have quite a different form of development. So it's um, around, that you know, around that 1950s, 60s era that things started to really change in how uh, planners designed suburbs. Hauranga, for example. Councillor O'Malley. Bishop, I, I'm actually going to come back to that same point that Councillor um, Wiley brought up very in uh, number 37 about the idea that um, smaller municipalities maybe would use regional councils to do their planning. Um, I understand the sentiment that, you, that you've just stated about the ability to have the resources to do it, but I think that this was the kind of approach that they took to transport about 15 to 20 years ago, handing public transport over to regional councils because they would have a better issue of had potentially, and, and it has resulted in potentially a loss of local or localism and local decision making. So I'm wondering if, if in the spirit of this, what we're really saying is that the resources for those, uh, those smaller areas should be centralised rather than the actual activity. In other words, potentially maybe they could have access to um, planners and designers that, that they are given by the government to do to assist them with their planning, but their decision-making processes still sit with them. Because there's always this, um, well, I'll get, no, that'll be my speech. <laughs> Appreciate the restraint, Councillor. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, further questions? Councillor Benson Poe? Have been Thank you. Is there a seconder? Seconded Councillor Lofiso. Would you like to speak to it? I just briefly, I'd like to add my thanks to the um, staff effort. Um, clearly, more than one person in our planning department has been involved in a comprehensive submission. I think it's moderate and appropriate. Uh, and thank you for the work ongoing. With the speakers. Councillor O'Malley. Oh, sorry. Anyway, continuing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my only point is it's a fairly minor one, but I think we always need to be cognizant of it, that when we try to make efficiencies, we often also hand over authority at the same time. So we need to be careful about when we hand over authority as much as when we're trying to just get efficiencies. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, yeah, I think this is a pretty good summary of um, and make a submission to the uh, Minister of the Environment. The one thing that I am consistently uh, frustrated about though, and there's not enough emphasis here for my liking, but yet I had the opportunity to add my um, input into it and I failed to do so, so um, I'll be happy to accept what is written here. Uh, and I also could make a personal submission if I chose to. So, but really focusing on the, um, the local authority planning should provide enough opportunities for development to meet the housing and business needs of people and communities, both current and future. And that comes from the national policy statement on <coughs> urban development capacity. And I think we need to move that up in a higher elevation when we're starting to look at a lot of these type of RMA submissions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Reddick. Yes, I uh, note item 10, the issues and options, all the, uh, lists the reasons why the system has not responded effectively. And uh, I think some of these criticisms are equally applicable to our own governing institution. And I think it will be good for us to keep one eye on the mirror as we send our thoughts up to central government. Um, well, I find it quite liberating to be allowed to have an opinion uh, on planning matters, no longer serving as a commissioner under the RMA. Uh, there are uh, three certainties uh, in life, death, taxes and RMA reform. Uh, and while um, recent uh, reform of the Resource Management Act has focused quite narrowly, um, particularly around um, 
are limiting public participation in RMA processes uh, and um, uh, and reducing environmental protection in the decision-making <coughs> framework. I think uh, what we're talking about here is a great opportunity to look at a higher level about what the at what the purpose of the Resource Management Act is uh, and whether that is fit for purpose uh, in, in, uh, in a contemporary environment. And I, I fully support moving from uh, the focus on, on it being an effects-based legislation to that of being outcomes-focused, and that was certainly uh, what we attempted to do with the second generation uh, district plan because, I've, because in particular, um, you know, it's significant to me that in, under the Resource Management Act, um, not only is it silent on considering the climate impacts of, uh, of activities, of land use activities, it expressly forbids consideration of uh, the impacts of activities uh, on climate change, and I don't think that is um, what you would consider fit for purpose, and nor does it meet uh, the purpose, really, of the Act itself, which is the sustainable use of natural resources for current and future generations. And so, um, it's, uh, and so I thank staff uh, for uh, the consideration that that issue has been given and elevating it to being a, a part two matter uh, under the Act, uh, because uh, town planning is one of the single greatest things that local, uh, single greatest contributions that we can make in terms of transitioning to a, uh, a zero carbon economy. Uh, and, and so th this work is important in terms of making sure that the planning frameworks under which we operate give us the tools to let us, uh, to let us um, do that, whether it's called smart growth or the postcard era or whatever the nomenclature uh, might be. Uh, and I do, I just want to pick up on the comments that have been made around the National Policy Statement for Urban Development Capacity. The capacity is the important word there. It isn't the National Policy Statement on Urban Land Supply. And freeing up land for uh, residential development uh, isn't the only option that you have available to us. And in fact, given where the infrastructure capacity is in the city right now, uh, it isn't uh, the answer uh, to, uh, to our, uh, our shortfall in, in residential development capacity. And freeing up land isn't a silver bullet uh, for, uh, for housing development, and particularly for affordable housing development. There are many other factors, obviously, that go into how affordable residential development is. Uh, but also, it's worth noting, again, that uh, to rezone that land, uh, that land needs to be serviced to be able to support that kind of development. Uh, and that means... <coughs> You know, to do that, that's, that's, a, that's significant work that needs to be done. And to fund that work, uh, particularly funding greater water infrastructure to support residential development and greenfield sites, that would either require um, far, uh, you know, far higher um, residential rates if you were to pay for it up front, or a far greater appetite for debt uh, than has been expressed around the council table in recent years. So I think we've got to be, I'm weary of uh, a reductive view to addressing uh, our urban development capacity constraints and focusing solely on um, rezoning land, um, not just for uh, you know, the, the longer term environmental implications of endless urban sprawl, but also the very <coughs> current short term financial implications of, uh, of us being able to allow that to develop in the first place. Further speakers, Councillor Benson Pope, your right of reply. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Thank you. Item 7. Submissions uh, on reducing waste and more effective landfill levy. Mr. Henderson, welcome. <coughs> Anything you'd like to add at this point? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'd just like to... Uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to raise in relation to the annual plan, but starting with the... Um, this is a fairly light submission, you will have noticed, that was basically due to the time frame that we had for responding to this submission, which due to existing workloads and staff leave over Christmas, we actually ended up with quite a short time frame to put something together, so it's a relatively light um, submission. There's two matters that are addressed in this consultation which were uh, raised in the annual plan meeting. Um, Obviously, this, the purpose of this consultation that is raising funds for investment in recycling infrastructure, 
uh, during the annual plan, I was asked about um, our recycling stockpile, etc. at the moment. I've had a meeting this morning with our um, contractor who informs me that at the moment we do actually have a stockpile starting to develop. The market for recycled material is drying up quite quickly at this point in time. Unfortunately, the extra investment in infrastructure is unlikely to occur uh, in time. Uh, we're looking at options in, in regards to that. Uh, also, I was asked another question in regards to litter enforcement. Um, and part of this consultation included allowing waste levy funding to be used for regulation and enforcement purposes, which would allow us to uh, obviously resource more uh, enforcement activity around uh, illegal fly tipping, etc. I just wanted to draw attention to those points as they were uh, brought up in the annual plan meeting on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Henderson. Councillor Lord. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and that's actually quite nice to hear that um, feedback from the questions were previously asked. I've just got a question, and it, it's not directly relative to this, so I just hope the Mayor will indulge me, but it's, it's relating to when we changed the contract and um, stopped using doubt at the landfill when we changed a few, uh, year, 18 months ago, one of the things that came in was that this would be a way that we would perhaps do the job better. Now, it's just, um, it's just a simple observation, and, and I feel bad confessing. I, I've really gone on a bit of a change my, my lifestyle and trying to reduce waste, and so I'm recycling more. And, um, but I did have some stuff that had to go over the, the tip face the other day, and uh, when I was there, I just couldn't help notice there was a guy throwing away an old swing set or something that was metal bars and paint and all that sort of stuff. And, I'm just, and, and while I was there, the guy just comes in with a scoop and booms it through to take up to the tip face, I presume. And, do we have any, um, has there been any extra work done to recycle some of that stuff at the tip face? Because sort of, I, I'm not wanting to jump down and pick stuff up, but there, it looks like there's certain stuff that is going through and just getting dumped at the tip face that could be recycled one way or another. And, and if the practices have not changed, are we doing our best as a city? Uh, I realise that's off the top of the submission, but. Uh, you know, I have to answer that because, yeah, there is a health and safety uh, point to people actually going through the stuff that's been put over the edge into the transfer station itself. One of the things that we have done is right beside the transfer pit, there is now a last chance scrap metal recycling bin right beside the transfer station, which would have been probably about 20 feet from where that person dumped into the transfer station. Um, so we're making, we are making efforts to try and give people that uh, that last chance or to put those resources sort of right there um, but we can't make them use them um, we're also making efforts to make to pull tires and that kind of stuff out so yes there are some efforts but been made um, there's always more that could be done councillor walker uh, th thank you for the report and uh, i look um it's appropriate doc document as I look worryingly across the table at, uh, at Councillor Wiley's single-use cup. Um, options table on page 71 uh, gives the options for, for what one does. And then in the submission document, um, the option that we submit on is option B. Why not option A? Sorry, can you, which number? Which question? In the submission document, um, uh, uh, you're cognizant of what I'm referring to. Yeah. Um, on, on, on page 71, there's a, there's a range of options. So page 71, at the, at section 12, the range of options. So option A, we were uh, concerned that that would mean the levy going up to uh, $20 a tonne in 2020. So we are already in the annual plan process um, and landfill fees have already been worked out. So we thought that was um, going to be a very challenging. Or councils generally. Working. Yes, it's working. It's, it's just my little quiet voice. 
Um, the, the landfill charges for this year um, have, are already progressing through the annual plan. Yeah. Just add to that, there, there, there could be an opportunity we could um, alter the annual plan um, charging and prices, but I'm just concerned about the time frame for the government to make decisions and us to actually be able to then include that change into the annual plan process at the very last minute because we need to obviously um, consult, uh, have those prices out in the public space prior to adoption by <coughs> council. Let's pick up on that though. Ultimately, this isn't a decision that we will make. So were government of a mind or ministry officials of a mind to <coughs> set it at a rate that was higher than what we may have signed off at the annual plan, my assumption is that we wouldn't have a choice. Or would we have to reconsult on the annual plan to do what we are statutory, statutorily required to do? Um, yeah, you're quite right. We wouldn't have a choice in it, but then um, the public, the, the users of the landfill also wouldn't have much of a chance to um, adopt any, or any behaviour change. Would preferred actually obviously have the prices advertised well in advance of the change coming in, if we, if we can. Um, but you're quite right. Thank you. Councillor Lord. Another question I was just going to ask, and I, I note that the inclusion, or it's, it's the DCC submissions inclusion that farm dumps be included, and I just wanted to know, do you have the information, I, I, like I've plead guilty, I've probably put things in farm dumps that I shouldn't have, and, and I'd also say that the, the times are changing, I note a guy in um, Cromwell a year or two ago was fined for burning tantalised posts, which I've also do that, although generally I do it in my fireplace, um, take the risk. <laughs> But um, <laughs> nothing wrong with arsenic, I don't think. Um, no, but my, my question was, um, while I, I, I realise there's a place for that and I'm not going to jump up and down about it, I just wonder, is there any clear rules at the moment from the regional council about what can and can't go in landfills? Uh, on farm? On farm dumps? Uh, no. No, there's not. So yeah. technically a farmer could place almost anything he wants in the ground and he wouldn't be breaching any regional council laws, yeah, as long as he covered it. Yeah. Councillor O'Malley. I think it's sort of my question's coming along the same lines, and, and I note your attempt to make farm dumps no longer exempted or under the same regulations at least. Um, so my question would be, if looking at the table that, that um, Councillor Walker brought up and, and the slightly differential charges of fees, if, if, if farm dumps were allowed to be exempted and the ORC has a policy that, that green waste dumping on farmland is an as a right activity, then if a levy is going to be imposed on a municipal landfill for accepting green waste and then we have a landfill nearby which is on rural zone land Regardless of how big it is, under the ORC, would, would, would it, regardless of how big it is, provide it's only taking green waste, be a permissible activity now without a fee on it? It currently is a permissible activity without a fee on and it. And if this goes through with exempting them from it, it would remain a permissible activity without a fee on it? Yes, it, only if they came under the levy would there be any compliance requirement. So by allowing farm um, exemptions, we are, allow, we are leaving a loophole for what was relatively large facilities provided they are on the right, <laughs> correctly zoned land. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, question regarding the, the costs. And basically what I see this is, uh, if we went to the $50 at 2023, what would a trailer cost increase by? Uh, well, um, we're bringing in the new, uh, the new charging regime, which is actually charging per 50 kg. Um, just for an example, they'll use the existing price for a tonne of general waste <coughs> as $180 a tonne. So that $50 would go straight on top of that and it would be $230 a tonne. So essentially, uh, and, and that would go straight through to government? And currently, the $10 they're collecting, 36 million, I think I saw. And ideally, they wanted to collect up around the 250 to 280 million mark. Uh, so, I guess our ratepayers 
uh, would probably not see that that money is passing across. Uh, it'd be us collecting it, but actually very little of it, unless we're applying for funding back, staying in the community. Uh, no, so half of that money, under the proposal, it would continue that basically half of that money is returned back to councils or territorial authorities uh, for waste minimisation activities. So we pay $10 to Ministry of the Environment and they give us $5 approximately back again. Are we guaranteed that $5? At the moment, under current legislation, we are. Um, yeah, that the consultation is out on that, and it, it, there is a question in the consultation about what changes um, you would like to see to the Waste Minimisation Act, but at this, which, uh, under which that levy is charged. At the moment, there's no proposed changes to the Waste Minimisation Act, so that five dollars at the moment is guaranteed. Okay, I, I, again, just for clarification in my mind, I thought that there, there was a fund that we would be applying to from those funds, and hence why they talked about 280, again, I think it was 286 million or, or something like that. So, so the other 50% of the levy, the $5 that is retained by MFE, um, minus administration costs that goes into a contestable fund, um, which can be applied, uh, but pretty much anyone can apply to that um, for building infrastructure, et cetera, for waste minimisation activities. Okay. Um, when we look at, uh, uh, on page 71, further down from the table, paragraph 17, um, the Ministry for Business, Innovation and Enterprise is looking at um, MFP <coughs> with the distribution of provincial growth <coughs> funds to be invested in a network of resource recovery facilities. Is that currently happening? Is there any municipal, um, any, anybody you know that's received provincial growth fund for that type of network of resources? Yes, that's currently happening. Um, so there have been upgrades to material recovery facility in Nelson, Tasman. Um, there's been interest shown in Dunedin and there's um, a paper going up to the mural forum to discuss that. Okay, so we are actively looking to apply in that space? It, there is communications between DCC and ORC in relation to the Provincial Growth Fund. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, sorry, yep, I would just add to that the problem we have in Dunedin with regards to that is we don't own our material recovery facility. It's a private contractor who owns it. Um, so we have to work via them for any application for that, an upgrade to that facility. Um, the uh, mural forum paper that's going up is actually talking about a regional approach to try and build additional facilities in the region. Thank you. I understand this is all about reducing waste, but uh, on page 104 of our papers, um, there's, there's a comment about incineration. And it's a very small uh, part of the, the, essentially the whole document. And, you know, we see a lot of evidence and a lot of information provided to us about, especially European cities and how good they are doing their waste minimisation. Uh, how little goes to landfill, but when you look at places like Sweden and a lot of these other European city, um, countries, a lot of their rubbish is, uh, or waste is insinuate and incinerated. So I'm, I'm thinking, why are we taking, and why is the government taking such a poor focus on this when it's proven to work in a lot of other countries around the world and with benefits? Uh. So to answer the incineration question, so yes, incineration um, is working well in places overseas which with much larger population base. Um, in order to effectively and efficiently run an incinerator in the New Zealand environment, you would need something in the region of 200 to 300,000 tonnes of waste a year to feed the incinerator. Um, the West Coast example that was uh, on the cards for a while was talking that sort of figures to actually make a economically viable uh, incinerator. On average, a incineration plant for waste is approximately twice the cost of landfilling, um, and that's if you can run it efficiently. Um, the, then you do get the return from uh, the energy produced, etc. But in order to actually have a reliable source of energy, you need a high throughput of 
um, of waste in order to make it work. But the scale, I understand the scale of incineration models and um, units are actually coming down where smaller quantities can be more viable. Um, and then when we take in the cost of $30 million, potentially, if not more, to develop something like Smooth Hill, I sort of, sort of, I, I sort of see us taking such a, a narrow approach to that aspect, and same with the government. All I, can, all I can tell you at this point in time is that the economics of incinerations just simply don't stand up. Okay, uh, no, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, in reading, again, all this and looking at waste minimisation, the part that I'm really struggling with is growing up as a kid and, and taking my bottles and getting 10 cents back and 5 cents back and, and looking at those communities and looking at my coffee cup that could easily you know, be done in the same way with a 10 cents return or, or type of thing, um, even though it is an eco cup, um, is the fact that um, the, the government doesn't seem to be tackling that and, I, and, and we don't address that either in the sense of saying uh, the government actually being a little more aggressive in that area. And they talk about numbers in Australia and yet a number of states in Australia do have that refund deposit. So hence the waste is being reduced. Uh, so, they've set up a, a national resource recovery uh, task force to look at this. So, this, this money that's generated by putting up the levy is what we need. So, so, you're exactly right, because I remember those days as well. What happened is when material recovery facilities came in and councils took on recycling systems is that we stopped investing in the infrastructure we needed to process these materials locally and we relied on overseas markets. Um, and we have created a rod for our own back in doing this. So what the National Resource Recovery Task Force is looking at is using this levy money to invest in infrastructure where it needs to be and networked across New Zealand so that we become more resilient to these shocks and we are dealing with our own waste in our own backyard. Um, I'd also just add to that that at the end of last year we did actually submit on another consultation which was around the product stewardship schemes. Um, so that does involve, design, and it's actually the design is underway at the moment, um, for six priority products, um, agrochemicals, tyres, uh, beverage containers including glass, and I've forgotten the other two. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, e-waste and... And carbon emitting gases, yes. Oh, I do recall that. Uh, I just, I, when I look at the, the sense of what the government is trying to get in this consultation or in this document, I just look at that reinforcement of <coughs> reducing waste going to landfill. Um, <coughs> one final question up from me is on page 127 uh, of the document, um, and it's, it's ensuring landfills and clean fills can meet data requirements. Uh, there's a comment there that the Weybridge installation is estimated at 60,000 to 80,000 per facility. Uh, and ongoing cost for each facility could be around $5,500 per annum for Weybridge maintenance and cal um, calibration. Um, and then researching what we did with Green Island, we were looking at a cost of 200 to 250,000 um, in what we submitted on and what we discussed at last year's annual plan. So I'm trying to get an under understanding is the government you know I know our figures were pretty accurate because you did a very robust job around that is the government in putting a figure up of 68 to 80 thousand per, per facility um, looking at it as very simplistic uh, I would suggest that is that figure is probably a bit too low um, the figure for Green Island was probably also particularly high for the simple fact that it also involved changes to traffic management around there and security system, et cetera, as well. So it was another a few jobs on top of just the Weybridge. Um, in the case of Green Island, because it's built on top of old landfill, uh, we have quite a su more substantial footing that needs to be put in uh, in geotech analysis because it's on old landfill, which is constantly lowering. But I would agree that the figure quoted in there sounds a bit optimistic uh, for the average landfill. Possibly even for a greenfield new installation, it's probably a bit low. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hall. 
on page 71, um, item 13, about class five clean fills and farm landfills. Now, clean fills have to be consented, is that right? On rural property? It, that clean fills are consented, yeah. Yeah. Once now, we know for, about for the farm landfills, that's only for um, waste produced on the farm, is that right? They can't take it outside. It's supposed to be. We don't know. Um, audits have been uh, undertaken elsewhere. Uh, ECAN did an audit in Canterbury. Um, there was all sorts, household everything um, in, those, in those farm fills. Yeah, I, I, know that, I know that it does go on, but I'm saying it's meant to be only the farm produced that's exactly right. And yeah. uh, the other clean fills have to be consented by the local authority. Further questions? I have one, and it's just around the recommendation. Sorry, it's on page 157 of the agenda. Our response to question seven around what our preferred proposed rate for municipal waste is and we've taken a um, taken the option of fifty dollars per per ton by 2023 the other options being 60 or other and i'm just interested in what that is based on is that i mean did we do any is there an assessment or do we have any information around you know price elasticity and behavior change or uh, is that what staff have considered might be a palatable option to the community, or what is the what's the the rationale? Yeah, it is um, looking at bringing. So they want different differential rates and to increase them over the years. So it is is kind of taking the the approach of setting it at, at a reasonable amount that's going to make a difference and encourage behaviour change, um, and then inc small increments over the next three years to get it to that, that stage at 20. Um, they may still increase the levy post-2023. So what we've seen in other countries is that levies sit between sort of, well, in Europe, as we were talking before, um, between 140 and $180 uh, dollars a tonne in levies. Um, you get to some, you have to rethink things at that, at that level about what these materials are and how you may be able to use them differently. So it's all geared towards circular economy outcomes. <coughs> um, that's what we're trying to achieve overall. Thank you. Councillor Milley. Looking at the, um, you know, the purpose of the levy is to encourage different activities and effectively reduce um, people using landfills as an option and, and going towards a circular economy. I'm interested in your opinion on why we would put a levy on contaminated soils disposal, because I would think it's a fairly, would you agree that it might be a fairly long stretch to suggest that a, a waste levy on contaminated soils is going to stop the soil getting contaminated? Because in the end, what you're trying to do is move that levy back to the activity as opposed to, we would be charging to accept it and, and put it in the appropriate facility, so we'd obviously have a charge to go with the proper storage of it, but wouldn't we almost be encouraging contaminated soils to go to the right place? The, the levy is set at a much lower rate, so it, it's set at $10 and continues to stay at $10 for the contaminated class three and four landfills, and I think, again, they're just applying a levy so that compliance can it can be regulated and there is some compliance. Without the levy, it doesn't trigger those mechanisms within the Act. Couldn't be a zero levy and trigger the mechanisms in the Act? I mean, the point being, I'm, I, it's, it's a side point to some extent in terms of what you were submitting today, but it just occurred to me looking at it, I complete, you know, from my perspective, I completely agree with the objective of the levy to reduce waste um, when we can and, and changing behaviour of things like packaging and the kind of materials that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. But contaminated soils are kind of a different thing again because we really it's something that reflects activities that went on maybe 50 or 100 years ago that we're now doing remediation around. And I'm just wondering in terms of feeding back to the government is how is it that 
putting a levy on that is actually helping with the remediation activities that would be going on. Yes, I, I understand. It, it is just to bring it into the act. It could be set at a dollar, you know, so long as it's putting it, if, if, it was a non, if it's a non-levied activity, then it falls outside. So it would need to be a levied activity. But yeah, we can we can include something specifying that it would that it seems wise to keep the levy really low for that particular source of material. That would be a useful addition, I think. Um, just on that, if you actually wanted a specific mention of that, the the submission is actually due on Monday. Yeah. Uh, that's part of the time frame issue. So, um, but we understand what you mean. So we'll yeah. draft a sentence that gives effect to the government to think about that issue. Yeah, just we won't have time to. Uh, we could. Um, send the sentence back to yourself, but we probably won't have time to... It won't be the end of the world if it doesn't make it <laughs> in. I'm just basically raising the, the concept, basically. Yeah, OK. Well, Councillor Raddick. Yeah, if you put a free, uh, a zero levy on contaminated soils, would that induce people to uh, class their soils that they wanted to get rid of as contaminated in order to get them through free to save money? That's a potential risk. Um, when when contaminated um, soils are accepted, it's certainly a green landfill that you, you need all the lab testing. We need to know what's in it. Yeah. So that's creating a loop. You don't really want to be creating another loophole. Exactly. No further questions? So I'd like to move the recommendations. Moved Councillor Hall, seconded Councillor O'Malley. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor Hall? Speakers? Councillor O'Malley? My only real comment is um, around the differential exp um, um, application of the levy between different activities and different landfills. Um, I feel that if it is not universally applied, it's only going to end up affecting negatively the best at practice landfills and, and material will get diverted away. So. You know, my message back, and we've said it, is just to reiterate that again, this needs to be universally applied or it won't work properly. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Sorry. Um, yeah, overall, I think um, this is a, a good submission. I'm quite wary of what the impacts could be on our residents going forward, but I think there's every household um, in Dunedin, I think every ho household around the country and even around the world is now on a great awareness of basically product stewardship and making sure that we reduce our waste and what goes to landfill. Um, I would have liked to have seen the government have a bit of a wider vision about other opportunities, but that's, again, uh, neither here nor there. I think one of the things that does come out of this and is touched on in the opening um, part of the document in the executive summary, uh, sorry, in the uh, message from the Associate Minister of the Environment was actually also focusing around the uh, historic landfills. And we have a few of those in our city and I think that's an important part, especially after what was learnt from the Fox Glacier landfill um, last year. So I think there's a lot of good things uh, in part of this uh, review and submission. The one part that I really look at is we all see these YouTube videos of about recycling and plastics and other materials being used in communities around the world. And when I look at the, the positive minds of the university and the polytech, we don't incorporate them enough in actually looking at what they can do and some of those smart minds and actually even allowing them to have some funding to set up projects to basically take some of the thoughts and develop them and incubate them and use them within our city. And probably the one thing that I, as I read through this and started looking at and going, you know, whether it's a provincial growth fund or other opportunities for funding, I think we could take a far stronger approach in actually setting up business competitions and really funding these business competitions and letting these smart minds develop their projects here in the city so we can actually be leaders in the space, not followers. Councillor Lord. Yeah, look, I'd just um, say I'm very supportive of this too, and I think uh, probably one thing, and I partly hold Mrs. Ms. Irvine responsible, and that was in my first term on council, I was um, in the infrastructure, and it made me think when I started thinking about these things from a, a point that I'd just never thought before, 
and I have made um, quite a few decisions. I used to just pay, well, originally in the old days, everything just went to hole on the farm. Then I got to buy a skip for $65 or $70 a month, $780 a year, and, and dumped everything just via that. Now I've, um, I've minimised my waste. I send recycling back into town with friends that have got recycling bins, and I'm doing a whole lot of things. And what I've realised is that the amount that the waste charges have gone up at Green Island is really the person that controls it. While we control the charges, you control what you pay. And I have absolutely limited, and I, I no longer dump on my property, and I have removed huge amounts out of the waste stream that no longer have to be there. And I think the thing that perhaps I feel the worst about is batteries, and that's using batteries when I'm in my headlight at night, um, probably go through four or six a month, uh, eight a month maybe, and I have to do something with them, and I just don't know what the answers are. But apart from that, you know, I, I now that I control my waste, then uh, it doesn't control me. So I think if people took that message, I think through education, the rest of New Zealand need to learn that message and they need to get that message that um, it's not about a council that's charging you too much for dumping your waste, it's about living in a way that we don't have the waste in the first place. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, I absolutely agree with what Councillor Wiley has raised, actually, and it's what I was going to say, um, is that I think there's opportunity in waste. I think there's a lot of business opportunities that could be created from, particularly from recycled stuff, and it sounds like by what um, you're saying, Chris, is that there's at the moment there's some recycled stuff that can't be got rid of, is that the case? Yeah, and I think that creates an opportunity for us as a city. We can see it as a problem or we could see it as an opportunity. And I would love to see us put either some government funds or some council funds into, and I think from what you're saying yesterday in the annual plan, if I'm correct, that that five, you know, the money we get back from reducing uh, or, or from the waste <laughs> to help with minimisation, maybe some of that could be used as a prize money, because I think you were saying it's got to be used for waste minimisation, is that just an idea, we had some of that money used as a prize for innovative ideas to do things with recycling. You know, there could be some amazing business ideas coming out of that. And I agree with what Councillor Wiley said, we could be New Zealand leaders in that area. Because we ha it's not sustainable to keep taking stuff to the landfill and we need to think innovatively about other ways, and I think we need to bring other um, industries involved as well, like the smart community, you know, our um, tech people as well could do some great stuff in that area, I think. Also, um, yeah, I mean, people are complaining profusely. If you read anything online, they're complaining madly about the prices of the landfill. But, and I think that's where we've maybe missed the boat a little bit, is around education, is that, you know, a lot of people perhaps would recycle more if they knew more. And particularly around, you know, comp maybe we could have, if, I don't know if it's something we've ever considered, but... Um, some compost that could be located around the city, you know, that we could take our food to or something. We need to make it easier for people to reduce their waste. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you. And uh, Councillor Lord, do remind me at Christmas to buy you a rechargeable uh, torch for your, for your <laughs> head. They're, they're, quite, they're quite good fun. Um, I broadly support the, the document. However, I do think the numbers that have been touted are very conservative, and I hope the government thinks, um, thinks more, is, is, is a bit braver in its thinking. The European example shows uh, that the greater the, the, the charge, the greater the incentive to minimise waste and create more sustain, sustainable alternatives. And I, like Councillor Wiley, remember the days of taking bottles back and getting money back for them. Um, but I'm, I'm, having read the document, I think it's been made very clear that the extra levies that are raised will look at the feasibility of introducing, uh, uh, of creating facilities to reintroduce those sort of measures uh, back to the future the way we've done in supermarkets with uh, the brave decision not to, to chuck plastic around all of our, our wonderful fresh vegetables. And I can't let the cup go, Councillor Wiley. Um, congratulations on purchasing an eco cup, but just be cognizant of the fact that only 3% of said cups ever get composted. So uh, please be brave. Thank you. 
wasn't anticipating this report to be quite so spiritual, but between Councillor Walker's, <laughs> between Councillor Walker's piety and Councillor Lord's Damascus moment, then it's been <laughs> quite something. Further speakers? <laughs> Councillor Raddick? Yes, I um, take issue with Councillor Walker's uh, piety, uh, especially since I don't think he's old enough to be having a paper copy and generating all that extra waste uh, of the uh, council agenda. He's being of the youth. He should be using his uh, tablet. Speaking of the agenda, sir, yes, I, I feel free to refer to it. To, yes, yeah. <laughs> quite so. And um, it does distress me going to the transfer station occasionally, as I do in Parry Street, that used to have a lot of recycling in place, uh, recycling bins, and now has none. Everything that goes there goes to landfill, but that's not a council site. Um, however, you know, I do agree with uh, Councillor Wiley that we don't have, we only have limited initiatives for recycling and um, waste minimisation in the town, and so I agree with Councillor Wiley that we uh, should tap into the resource of intellect that we have in the town to generate some studies and initiatives and um, mechanisms to initiate some recycling activities here in Dunedin. To the speakers. Well, I'm broadly supportive uh, of the submission as drafted and commend staff for uh, wading through the documentation in order to present something in the time frame that, is, uh, that has been provided to us. I mean, comments have been made around what the government's uh, objectives are. I mean, the government's view is quite clear and it matches the view of this council, actually, in that we are aiming to minimise uh, waste, and, and that is uh, the objective of the discussion that is at hand. And, and waste, you know, solutions to the waste problem, much like the solutions to... Uh, to climate change rely on um, behaviour change and not band-aids. And that is what uh, incineration is, and that is what waste to energy is. They're band-aids to our current patterns of, uh, patterns of consumption. Uh, and, you know, there are plenty of examples internationally, I'm aware of them too, where uh, muni municipalities, often with significant uh, private investment, which uh, makes throughput mandatory, which goes against waste minimisation full stop, um, by, by turning it into fuel for your public transport system, you turn your waste into a public good, which does absolutely nothing to disincentivise people from producing waste in the first place. Um, and, and while I agree that, you know, in terms of behaviour change, one of the big drivers of behaviour change is price uh, and cost, uh, I think we do need to be cognisant of the fact that um, anything in this field uh, disproportionately impacts people who are most price sensitive, uh, and that is people who are uh, on lower incomes, and I think it's, you know, it's related to the next paper uh, that we were talking about, security of income, and it's difficult to keep ratcheting things up uh, when people's ability to pay those charges uh, doesn't ratchet up accordingly, and I mean, I love the European models as much as the next person, but uh, they have far more um, humane uh, social welfare systems uh, that do mitigate the impacts uh, that um, approaches like this uh, can have. Uh, but ultimately, I think one of the biggest issues around dealing with the waste problem is that far too much of the responsibility of the issue has been loaded onto the end user, and that individuals and households are expected to deal with this rather than producers and consumers of the waste products themselves. And if you're to drive uh, system change uh, in terms of designing waste out of the system full stop, that's never going to happen based on a household and individual scale action. It will only happen when uh, producers and distributors uh, of these materials are forced to take a more active role in reducing uh, what is produced in the first place. And I, I applaud the efforts that are happening um, nowhere near fast enough around mandatory product stewardship. We've had since 2008 uh, legislation that enables that, and more than a decade on, we still don't have uh, a mandatory product stewardship scheme, even for our most toxic products, let alone uh, everyday household items, the likes of which um, would, be, uh, would be incredibly useful. So uh, again, you know, useful steps along the way, but uh, we need far greater direction, I think, from, and far greater support, regulatory support, uh, from, from central government if 
us here at a municipal level, at a council level, uh, to achieve what we have set out to achieve uh, through our waste minimisation plans and our obligations under the Waste Minimisation Act. Councillor Hall, your right of reply. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Thank you. Item 8. Submission on employment, labour markets and income, technological change and the future of work, draft report. Mr Coffey, welcome. Ms Pinfold. Anything to offer on opening? Just one, um, just one comment. Just um, our apologies for the lack of um, quality control on the submission that's attached to your agenda. I'm afraid you've got um, a draft version, so we'll correct the um, grammatical errors and the tone of a couple of the sentences to be more appropriate for a submission before it goes before it goes out. Thank you. The acting deputy mayor is very pleased. <laughs> Questions <laughs> of the report, Councillor Wiley. Um, am I correct in the sense of the tone or the, the way I saw this report was more about um, how the technology <laughs> change in the future of work would affect our residents rather than um, the positive aspects that where our uh, businesses and the people and our residents could benefit from the change? The report acknowledges that there are both benefits from new technology but also, as we've seen in history, there are also some people who are left behind because of that technology, and it's urging that both sides are taken into account. That's the intention of our submission. So what, I, I guess, <coughs> I guess hierarchical, in the sense of what I'm reading here, it was very much around, you know, there's a lot of reference around uh, Uber Eats and Lime Scooter people and things like that, where I sort of, understood that aspect of it but uh, versus a higher level and, I, and the one that I'm thinking of is for example Ryan Baker and Timely you know that basically has a set up a great business here in Dunedin that's relatively virtual and people can work from home and the technology has really assisted in that basis and also the benefits from Gig City. Yeah. Uh, as, as Paul's mentioned, there's, a re there's an acknowledgement at the beginning of the submission um, of the benefits of technology. The submission focuses on omissions or things that we think are missing from the, um, or need to be emphasised. Um, so, we, so we acknowledge your, your um, point about the positive aspects. Okay. Um, okay, I'll leave it at that. I'll wrap my right my comments. Thank you. For the questions, Councillor Elder. Um, there's a lot of people out there who cannot afford the internet, who um, cannot access or don't know how to use computers, and the digital divide is um, creating inequality. And so, what's your comments on? the submission related to that. So we acknowledge, that, as we said, both the advantages of the technology, but also that there may be some people who are disadvantaged, that there needs to be a look at um, the labour laws and what a worker is considered a worker or an employee as opposed to someone who's working um, as a contractor. It's, a, it's an open market in reality, so we just, we want the, council, the sorry, central government to have a deeper look at that. And there's an expression that, um, that the government has to input into that area. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it makes sense to make a submission. I mean, you, you know, it's an opportunity and I think the council should have its say. I agree with um, both the previous councillors that there are 
a lot of opportunities, particularly in the digital tech sector. And with our um, funding we've got through the Provincial Growth Fund for Code, I think we could usually, you know, see a lot of that happening here. And that's very exciting. I think there's a lot of opportunities for Dunedin. Um, <clears throat> but is there, you're a right. is there a question coming, Councillor? Uh, well, the question, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Would someone like to move the report or the recommendations? Move Councillor Barker. Second to Councillor O'Malley. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Further speakers? <laughs> Councillor Wiley? Um, thank you. Yeah, um, I am. I, I am conscious of the importance of what the submission is about and the effects it has. Um, but, for example, um, I am frustrated that there is no mention of Dunedin being a gig city uh, anywhere in the submission. So, and I thought that was one of the biggest changes for our city in the last, uh, since 2014 when we became uh, recognised as having the fastest internet in the southern hemisphere and the benefits that is bought. When you look at a company like Blue Jeans that works virtually um, down on Princess Street in, uh, with their San Mateo office in a streamlined fashion, you see that actually the world is changing in how we do business. And actually Dunedin is very well positioned for that aspect. You know, digital nomads are, is a reality in this world. It's not a made up thing where some people just go walking away with their laptop but there are people work, working in Dunedin from their homes or working from spaces like Petri Dish, Regis or Innovate HQ that are doing business around the world on a daily basis. And I don't think this submission really has taken that into effect as much as it could have. When you look at the freelancing market and the contractors and things like that, there is a lot happening and you just have to look at Xero and the way they've established their businesses and how they've changed the accounting processes and how accountants even operate we have to have a factor of how that is going to a, uh, have an impact. It's a bit like you know, Dunedin City Council and our planning department. Not all the planning work is ever going to be done in-house. Sometimes we're going to outsource it. But even better is if a lot of the outsource work could come to us on the other side. I do think there is an acknowledgement that some lower skilled or um, some parts of our community may struggle with this. But I actually see Dunedin World placed in a position to actually promote and educate and do a far better job in ensuring that everybody gets to participate on a global market rather than just worrying about our local market. Councillor Hulahan. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, I, I, from an entrepreneurial point of view, I mean, my master's is in entrepreneurship and I have a, a huge interest in this area around some of the new jobs that are going to be created and I think some of the things that are going to happen we haven't even seen yet, you know, there aren't the job descriptions to write about them and that's, while it's scary and can create some insecurity, it's also exciting. I'd love to see us as a council lead the way in some of these areas and it might be we can do that through some of these growth funds if allowable, I'm not sure where that, but, but I certainly see it through the gaming and through digital, and that sits with that code. And I definitely um, think we have to think that way, because if we don't, we'll be left behind. And so, you know, I see it as an opportunity rather than a negative. Councillor uh, Raddick. Yes, I'd like to uh, congratulate the team on points six, seven, eight, and nine. Mm -hmm. Uh, I noticed around the table we uh, have focused largely on the uh, the uh, above average half of the population that ha is capable of doing online activity and jo uh, producing work and income from uh, the internet. But the converse is also true and I think it's good to uh, cover that off in this submission. So thank you. Councillor Walker. Yep, just echoing if uh, is that on? Yep, echoing a few other people. Uh, no problem with us looking at how we can maximise the benefits of tech while uh, looking to obviously mitigate um, some of the, the potential harms. But um, let's not forget as well that over the last 30 years, the technology has been a significant source of new job creation. 
um, an opportunity. And more importantly, let's not also forget that lack of technology has been a disaster for human rights in many parts of the world, uh, places like Bangladesh, India, China, Indonesia, to name but a few. Thank you. Councillor Barker, your right of reply. Um, I just have one thing to add, which was when I was a council employee and I was at the business clinic, it was quite shocking to me the amount of people that actually didn't have access to technology, so I fully support the submission. Put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Thank you. Item 9, committee delegations. Sorry, I found it. Committee Structure and Delegations Manual, 2019. The report has read. Any questions, councillors? Councillor O'Malley? It's... Um Relating to the uh, membership of the Māori Participation Working Party, um, which is effectively chairs of existing committees, and I know there's been some. I know that when I was on the council for my first cycle and not a chair, um, in effect, was not able to attend those meetings. And I know there's been some discussion about who should and should not attend. And obviously, only half of the affected party group <laughs> is here today. Um, but I'm wondering if consideration for non-chairs to have some knowledge of what is at that meeting because, of the, because I certainly wanted to have a positive interaction with that working group in the last training and obviously wasn't able to because of the delegation. Yeah, I mean, it's a point well made and there's plenty of work for that group to be doing uh, in the short term. And as, as you're aware, Councillor, that was discussed at the last meeting of this group. Um, and not just in terms of uh, other elected members of this uh, organisation being able to attend those meetings, but also executive members of the various Runaka uh, committees who currently um, don't have access to those meetings either. Um, but as with anything uh, in this space, that discussion is um, collaborative, and, but certainly it's something that I'm, I'm keen to, to, uh, to allow for, but we'll work through that with, um, with our Runaka... Thank you, Councillor Hulahan. Uh, we'll work through that uh, um, in due course, but I don't think there's anything in the, in the delegations manual that excludes attendance, if that's the issue that you... Not attendance, no. Yeah. Councillor Hulahan. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, I can come back, I can wait. <coughs> uh, it's another question about it. Just the committee that um, assesses the chief executive's um, performance, is that on this list? No, I think there's a comment made on it um, in here, only briefly. Um, my, my intention isn't to reconstitute that committee, but instead to uh, contract out that work to people with expertise in performance appraisal. Um, and so and that will be a process that will involve um, all elected members in it. But Given the, so given the fact that everyone is involved and it will be facilitated by an outside person setting up a committee to achieve that seemed unnecessary. That 100% answers my question. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a summary of that uh, in the report. <laughs> uh, Councillor Houlihan. Um, some of the committees have two deputy chairs. When there's two deputy chairs, how do we work out which one is going to be chairing if the chair isn't there? That will be a question to take up with the relevant committee chair. Well deflected. Any other questions? Uh, I'll move that the manual be adopted. Second of Councillor Hall. Any speakers? There being none, I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Those against? That's agreed. Is that the end? That's the end. Well, thank you, everyone, for your for your attendance. It's been quite a week. Uh, those with a particular issue with uh, interest in government funding of transportation projects, um, Councillor O'Malley is convening a cabal of you somewhere in the vicinity afterwards if you want to talk about uh, that. Otherwise, uh, we'll see you uh, at.
or taco next week. Um, so thank you, Bishop. I think I, I, if we're happy Otara. enough to sit in here, or we can go uh, somewhere. Can we go into the Otara room? Otara room would be fine. There's a yeah. very light lunch coming there too, so that's. Okay, cool. I just want your feedback from the email I sent out earlier on.